I have something a little different for you in today's video. In a second, I'll be introducing Tommy Z, who runs a music production company that makes music for brands and businesses around the world. And in this video, he's gonna tell you his story of going from a job in banking that he hated to working full-time as a musician and music producer, making custom music for adverts and videos and stuff like that. For anyone who dreams of quitting their day job to go full-time as a musician or music producer without going down the highly challenging become a famous original artist route, this is gonna be really insightful and I highly recommend you watch the entire video to hear Tommy's whole story. But if you just wanna get Tommy's tips after years of doing this to help you break into this industry and start making music for brands and businesses, then you can skip to 38 minutes and 42 seconds. And that's where he reveals kind of the biggest lessons that he's learned over over the years. So, over to Tommy. Hey musicians on a mission, my name is Tommy Z and my mission today is to inspire and inform you about a way of making a living with your music that you may not be familiar with. Today I'm going to share my story with you of how just over 10 years ago I left my corporate career to make a full-time living making music for brands. Now, why should you listen to me? I got three reasons. Number one, I do make a full-time living producing music, songs, scores, or sounds for big brands like Nike, Google, Adidas, Heineken, Honda, and many, many more. Me and many of my musician friends around the world we are indeed lucky because we get to spend most of our days and sometimes nights in a studio tweaking knobs, pressing on pads, and crafting sound all day that we're going to get paid for. But not only that, thousands of people, maybe even millions, are going to see our work. That's the first reason you should listen to me. The second reason you should listen to me is because... Even though I'm making a full-time living as a music producer today, it wasn't always this way. Once upon a time, I did have a day job and I needed to keep this day job to pay my bills. But deep down inside, I was dreaming of making music my full-time career. Now, because at the time I had no idea how to go about doing that, I wasted so much money and so much time confused and trying to find my way and afraid that actually I will never be able to make a living from music. But I did manage to do so. That's the second reason why you should listen to me. I'm not speaking from theory. This is from personal experience and blood, sweat, and tears of making that almost impossible journey from my corporate, safe, cushy career to the world of sitting in a studio all day and being able to put food on the table with the music that I'm producing. The third reason you might wanna listen to me is because my story could be your story. What you're about to hear is personal experience. This is not theory. I'm not giving you advice on how to make it as a full-time musician. I am telling you exactly how I did it. And it's not just my path. It's a path that many of my musician friends who are also making a full-time living making music for brands took. So these are lessons you want to pay attention to. If you are one of those folks that has the musical talent and is a good candidate for our industry, then my story story could definitely be your story. So here's the picture. It's 2005. It's five years since I graduated from university with a degree in political science. And like most people with a degree in political science, I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. Maybe that's not entirely true because I already was involved in music and deep down what I really wanted was to make music my career. It's just that I had no idea how music could be my full-time career and how I could still put food on the table. So by day, I was actually holding down a day job as a banker on Toronto's Bay Street, sitting on the 37th floor of a skyscraper in a cubicle, riding the subway with the rest of the sardines tightly packed in this can every single morning, everybody with their head down, depressed, spilling out of the subway into the escalators downtown. The escalators took us to the elevators and we were on our way. Where? To our dream? Hell no. We were on our way to our damn cubicle. And you get to the cubicle, the next best thing that can happen to you is the coffee machine, right? 
So you go to the coffee machine. From the coffee machine, you go to the conference room. In the conference room, you do a conference call. You use big fancy corporate words like synergize, leverage, maximize shareholder value, and all sorts of other meaningless language that is slowly sucking the life out of you. After the conference call, what do you do? You get back to your desk and you work on some spreadsheets. That's right, folks, spreadsheets. Now imagine for a soul that is musical, like me and many of you watching, doing spreadsheets, standing behind counter, working retail, driving a forklift, doing construction, whatever it is that you do is very tiring for a musical soul. Why? Because we are sensitive souls. We sense when we are in the wrong place. I mean, everybody knows why you have to hold down a day job. We have to pay our bills. We got to be responsible, right? But that doesn't mean that the day job feels right, that it feels good. Not at all. I spent a tremendous amount of energy every single day trying to keep a positive face because obviously that's what you got to do. But the funny thing is I'm not a very good liar. And so a few years into my corporate gig as a banker, I started getting more moody and I started losing my patience, especially when I was sitting in these meaningless meetings and hearing these huge words from Bob, who would say, well, we got to ensure that we maximize shareholder value. Really, Bob? Is that what we got to make sure we do? Obviously, we got to maximize shareholder value. But how exactly, Bob, do you propose that we do that? You see, I was just getting basically restless and losing my patience with the bullshit, right? With the corporate bullshit. And the funny thing, I thought I was actually going to get fired. But it seems that upper management took notice of me. So instead of firing me in my second and third year, I got promoted and I kept getting promoted because people were looking at me going, wow, this guy is real concrete. This guy is leadership material. So here I am going, I actually don't want to be here. And I'm going, hmm, how about a raise? And how about a title that is even longer than your previous title? Now your executive title is so long, you need like two business cards to hand out to people. And you know what? I won't lie. Day jobs, or if you're in a corporate career, you'll know this. They have this sneaky way of sort of keeping you hypnotized and keeping you sedated with these little positive things that happen once in a while. It could be a small raise. It could be like a company trip where everybody gets drunk and complains about their fate. And then you go, well, you know, this is not so bad. Actually, look at everybody else. They're all so unhappy. We're in this together. It's fine. And you know, at the end of the day, this is a safe paycheck, right? So maybe I should just hold on and I shouldn't be so upset about this. But folks, here it goes. This soul will not shut up, right? You're musicians. You're artistically minded people. You know what I'm talking about. Your conscience will not shut up. You know when you're in the wrong place. And that was the case with me. Despite the promotions, despite the pay raises, and despite that temporary feeling that everything is okay, I was not living my truth. I simply was not living my truth. I had to put on a face. I had to pretend that everything was okay when deep down, I was actually feeling quite restless and depressed and desperate about the fact that I am not spending most of my precious life, this one precious life, in the studio. I had these feelings of anxiety like pressing on me, like, dude, you're not getting any younger. And here you are like doing conference calls and spreadsheets and all these things that aren't even your superpower. Your superpower, your strength, your fire is making amazing sounds. And that's what I was already doing by night, right? The thing I loved most was basically left until nighttime and weekends. And I know that many of you can identify with that. And I was like, well, if I leave the thing that is most important to me till night, when I'm tired and uninspired, because I spent all day in a cubicle, then what realistically could be my chances of making this into a full-time career? When I'm devoting it the least amount of time, and the energy I have is basically like gone by the time I get to my music. How could I possibly, with this setup, be able to make a full-time career? So you can understand that I was getting nervous and anxious and all that stuff. And I remember like today, I would leave 
every lunch hour, I would be, everyone would have lunch together in a food court somewhere, but I would just walk away with my journal and I'd go for these long walks. And basically I try to keep my soul and my dream alive, right? Not to end up like some of the people that I was working with, that basically I noticed that they just gave up. They just gave in. They just accepted their fate. And that voice from inside that was telling them, hey, maybe you should pursue photography, or maybe you should pursue uh, public speaking, or maybe you should pursue carpentry, or whatever it is that your soul is calling you to do, I saw that they stopped listening to that whisper. And eventually that whisper really dies down, believe me, and I've seen it. It's like the color and the substance and the fire leaves the faces of those people. And I didn't want to end up as one of these people. So every lunch hour, I would separate. By the way, I'm not criticizing anybody who works a corporate career or any banker or anything like that. There are people who belong at these corporations. They're very good at what they do. And I've had the pleasure of meeting them. So I don't want you to think that I'm somehow criticizing people who drive a forklift or work in a bank or work behind the counter. Simply what I'm saying is that some of us, some of us feel deep inside that that isn't our truth and we feel called to work with our hands, to create sounds, to sew, to paint, whatever it is that you feel called to do. And that in those circumstances, you have to resist the reality that is maybe the majority of your day at that moment. You have to keep that inner fire lit because everything around you, everything around you is basically saying you have very little chance of following that dream. And here you have a safe job, a safe pension. Look, everything is safe. And it sort of lulls you into complacency. So the reason why I walked away for long lunches is to write in my journal and to keep that fire alive and to keep reminding myself that life is short. And I don't want to die in a cubicle. I don't want to spend most of this precious, miraculous life taking the easy way. I want to take a risk, right? I want to try. And even if reality is not showing you any signs that you're about to go and make music full time and make it a career, that inner fire stays lit so your eyes are open, your ears are open, and you're constantly watching out for opportunities. So I had this friend while I was working at the bank who worked at an advertising agency, and he knew that I was a DJ and producer by night. And he said to me, hey, we have this Xbox event that's happening. Xbox is launching in Canada. Remember, this is like late 2000s. Do you want to DJ this event? And that was, I was like, yeah, sure. And that was like the first exposure that I had to the world of music and brands. And af a few weeks after this event, he said to me, so you're also producing music, right? And I was like, yeah. You know, I spend my nights and weekends in the studio doing remixes for various labels and artists. I'm getting my music license to compilations. And he was like, okay, um, we're actually working on this campaign for Pontiac Aztec where we're going to create a compilation CD and we're basically sourcing music from different artists. So do you want to pitch in? Do you want to contribute a piece of music to this CD? And I was like, hell yeah. I've never done anything like that before. I've never actually done anything for a brand. The Pontiac Aztec is probably the ugliest car in the world in the history of cars. But you know what? I didn't care. It was a new experience, a new project, something I haven't done before. So I said, yeah, absolutely. So he sent over a brief. A brief is like project description, what the client basically expects, what they want you to do. So they basically wanted like a three to five minute electronic track that's going to go on the CD. So I went away. It took me two days to sketch a track, put it together, send it over to him. He sent back his comments. I did a few tweaks and revisions. I sent it back and he was like, okay, we're done. This is great. Uh, I'm going to let you know when the CD's out. And I'm like, okay, well, that was pretty painless. Um, I'll wait for the check. And I went back to the bank and I got back into my subway spreadsheet conference call coffee machine conference room routine, which very quickly sedated me until the point where I almost forgot about the fact that a few weeks ago, I did this project until, until I remember 
getting the check, getting the check. And I opened this check while I was sitting on the 37th floor of this corporate tower cubicle, bemoaning my fate. And I opened this check and I couldn't believe my eyes. For a few days of work in a studio that I enjoyed, that I did with pleasure, I got paid more than what my bank salary for three months was, okay? Now, even if this check was less, even if this check that I received was much less, it was still beautiful to see any, any amount of decent money for being able to sit in a studio and make music, right? Compared to having to be devoting most of your waking hours to a corporation that even if they pay you a lot, because at this point I was getting paid pretty well, don't forget I was getting promoted for being pissy and losing my patience. Even at this point, I knew, that's when I knew that if the bank is paying me this much money and I cannot find a way to be happy, then obviously something has to change. So what was the fundamental eureka for me? Look, the reason why I couldn't leave the bank before that day was because I couldn't see a clear path to how music could become a full-time career. Back then, the way you'd make your money is from uh, getting paid for remixes. So labels would pay you a few thousand bucks to do a remix. I was getting paid from DJing. I was a resident DJ in a number of huge Toronto clubs. If anyone's from Toronto and you're watching this, you know the government, you know Fluid, you know Atlantis, you know Whiskey Saigon. I was a resident DJ at all of those clubs and the money was decent, but I didn't want to be a DJ for the rest of my life. And I did not think that these sporadic remix projects that pay a few thousand here, a few thousand there were enough. They were not consistent enough. And by then sales of music were already going down because more and more people started discovering how to basically get their music for free. Imagine today, I mean, people are still trying to sell singles for pennies to people who are streaming it for free. You got to wake up, musicians. You got to wake up. The reality is people get their music for free today. So you have to, if you want to make music full time and not go homeless, go where the money is. And that's where my epiphany was. I was like, you know what? It's hard trying to get money out of promoters, out of people, out of labels. But brands, of course, brands are spending millions on creating content, billions on creating content, and millions of dollars of that goes to music production. They have the money. They just need the craftspeople. They need someone to create this music. And I was like, that is, that is a path that I can follow. That is a path I can understand. And so that day, I decided this is going to be my career. Right then and there, almost, I wish, because then it would be a great story. But I didn't quit right then and there. I slept on it for a few days. But let's just say for dramatic effect, that I, right then and there, I stood up with the check from Pontiac Aztec Music in my hand. I walked into my boss's office and said, you know what? I quit. No more spreadsheets, no more conference calls, no more riding the elevator to the 37th floor, no more riding the subway in the morning, no more spending my precious life working at something that I do not feel passionate about. It is time to spend the rest of my life in the studio. See ya. And he said, yeah, don't let the door hit you on the way out. And so here was my new life. I'm off. I left the safe safe harbor and sailed away into uncertain waters. Well, they didn't seem that uncertain to me, right? I knew exactly what I was going to do, make music for commercials, for big brands. I'd get paid probably the same amount that I got paid from this project. Life was looking beautiful. What happened? I went out and I rented with another guy a beautiful studio space that we then spent uh, months, weeks, turning into a full-fledged studio, beautiful floors and two floors and <clears throat> everything decked out, right? All the soundproofing, isolation, all of that. I went and spent money on a fancy website, fancy business cards. 
I mean, I really felt so confident about this that that I was sure that the money that we invest in the studio, the website, and these business cards is going to pay back instantly. We just need another project, right? So I started calling advertising agencies and basically saying, hey guys, you know, I make music for commercials. I'm a composer. Next time you're working on a commercial, call me and I'll hook up the music for you. And I made probably about like a hundred of these calls at least. Sent a few hundred emails to advertising agencies in Toronto. And you know what? You know how many people got back to me? Zero. This is how many people got back to me. Weeks went on, months went on. I see my savings account being drained. I'm basically getting nowhere. I have this fancy studio. It's not doing me any good. The website, I'm not even sure anyone's looking at it. I can't even hand a business card to anybody because I'm not able to, to actually connect with anybody. And I was like, what the hell am I doing wrong? And I started to think that my worst fear is about to come true. What's the worst fear? that I'm gonna have to go back to the bank on my knees and ask for my job back. I mean, you can imagine that would be pretty humbling and pretty damn disappointing for a guy that thought just a few weeks ago that I would be the king of the world in my new career making music for brands. So I actually started putting out the feels at the bank to see if they might take me back. And I talked to a friend of mine who said to me, where did you go? Like you suddenly disappeared. And then I came to work and there was an empty cubicle and you weren't in there. Like what happened? And I said to her, you know, I actually left because I did this project for the Pontiac Aztec. And what I really want to do is make music for brands and for commercials. And so that's what I left to do. But the problem is I haven't had another project since that project. And to top things off, my friend who gave me that project left the ad agency, left the advertising world altogether and started working for a sports TV station. And so I had no more places that I could get projects from, basically, because everyone I was calling was not getting back to me. So she was like, oh, okay, advertising, music for ads, interesting. She said, look, uh, before you crawl back on your knees to the bank, why don't you try calling my friend? Okay, I'm gonna introduce you to somebody. This guy works at a major ad agency in Toronto. They do all the cool brands like Mini, right? Go there, talk to him, have a coffee with him, and uh, let's see what happens after that. I said, okay, sure. This friend of a friend who works at an ad agency, even though he was busy, I mean, he was a busy guy, he decided to do it as a favor for my friend at the bank, and he met with me for a coffee. He listened to me for about two minutes before he said, stop. You're doing everything wrong. You're doing it all wrong. Nobody is actually going to work with you. And I was like, wow, okay, tell me how you really feel. And I was like, why? What, like, what exactly am I doing wrong? And he said, look, the fundamental problem, he said, is you're approaching people, but you don't understand how the business works. We at advertising agencies do not actually work with individual composers. That's not where we get our music for commercials. And I'm like, it's not? And who makes your music? And he said, advertising agencies work with special music production companies that specialize in making music for commercials. And I was like, okay. He said, look, that project you did with your friend, that's an exception. That's because you knew the guy and he brought it to you as a friend. But generally speaking, 90% of the cases, the advertising agency has a network of suppliers. These are editing companies, film production companies, and music production companies, commonly called in our business, music houses. He said that is who advertising agencies call. They don't waste their time with individual composers. Why? Because music houses basically have a roster of composers, usually freelance, and so the agency doesn't have to deal with like 10 or 15 composers per project. They leave it to the music production houses to be responsible for the entire process and to oversee all of the composers that each music production house deals with. 
So I was like, okay, now I understand why nobody was getting back to me. Instead of contacting advertising agencies, I should be going after music houses. He said, yes, thank you very much. Will you pay for my coffee? I'll see you later. That was probably the most valuable coffee that I've ever had with anybody because it literally changed the course of my career. Soon thereafter, what I did is I started contacting music production houses in Toronto. I still had the fancy website, so that was good. And the one thing I did that was very effective, and this is something that I teach in my master class because it really is a game changer, is I teach people how to approach the industry. You see, I've helped a lot of musicians to break into this business. And the one thing that I see that many musicians do wrong is the way they go about contacting people. They may be talented, they might have the skill, but they sabotage themselves just by the way they write the emails or just by the way they do not have a link for me to check something out. And even if they do have a link for me to check something out, when I get to the site, I have no way, I, have, I don't know where to look. Like there's too much information. I am a busy person. Most of us industry insiders who are working on commercial campaigns, we have deadly deadlines, okay? We're talking about two days, three days sometimes, sometimes even 24 hours to come up with a piece of magical music that has to air in a few days. So you can imagine that if I open emails and I read long autobiographies about you playing the flute from the age of three, it's not exactly something that I can use at this moment. And therefore I have to stick to my priorities, right? So one thing that I did when I was getting into the business is I already kind of felt the speed of the advertising industry. I kind of got a sense for it. So I knew that whatever link I sent to my work cannot take them to like, you know, 30 minutes worth of music where they're trying to figure out what my strengths are. What I did is I took my best sketches, okay? And I had a lot of really short sketches on my hard drive and I'm sure you guys can identify with that. Unfinished, they don't need to be finished. But what I did is basically I went, okay, what are the things that give me goosebumps and that I love working on? And at the time it was, electronic music, emotional sort of stuff that has some grit and some goosebumps. And so that was one thing. But the second thing was the second criteria that I had is, okay, what could I picture in a commercial, in a Gatorade commercial or a BMW commercial or a Nike commercial? What kind of things am I seeing there? And so where is that intersection between the things that I do really well and the things that brands or advertising agencies might actually want to put on their commercial. And so when a piece of uh, music or a sketch that I had on my hard drive met these two criteria, I basically smashed it all in one folder and then just kept, it was kind of like a tournament. It was like, I started with a hundred, then I was like, okay, but how many of them I could see in a commercial? Well, only half of them. Okay, so half of them. And then it was like out of this half, it's like, okay, but how many of them really give me goosebumps? Like it only takes four seconds for me to go, wow, what an interesting sound. Okay, maybe like 15 of those. So then I took 15 of those pieces and I edited them into this seamless blend of 90 second music. So it was like, you can imagine it's 15 different pieces, very different, like from a little piano riff to this huge buildup that ends up in this giant beat to this other driving riff. I wish I kept it. I have no idea what I did with it. But the point was it all seemed like one and it was really well edited. So I gave the recipient of my email like the least amount of trouble in finding out who I was and what I was about. I literally attached this 90 second piece of music into the email when I emailed these music production houses. So all they had to do is read a short mail, not long mail, not my autobiography, nothing about playing flute at the age of three, but short, short email with this thing. Hey, check it out. This is what I do. They click and boom, they get 90 seconds of just incredible goose bump music, right? So what happens when I started getting in touch with music production houses? They started getting back to me, right? They heard the music, they were impressed. 
I started getting called in for meetings. One of those studios in Toronto said to me, hey, uh, you seem like a really cool guy beyond just the composing stuff. You know, the real value that we see here is that maybe you could go to the ad agencies and you could try to get us work. So you could basically be like our sales guy that you could sell yourself as our music producer. And I said, hmm, that sounds very intriguing. Yeah, sure. I'm a big believer in using all of the tools that you're working with. Some composers want to be locked away in the studio. Like they don't even have people skills. And I know this because I work with the best composers in the world. And some of them, they're difficult people. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. But I actually thrive on being in here, crafting sounds in the studio, and connecting with people. This is also why I do this. I mean, I think you can sense the fact that I get very enthusiastic about sharing stories, sharing wisdom, and, and seeing that turn into results for people. So I went out there and I started calling ad agencies now as a very junior member of this studio. Now, look at what happened. I went from being from holding a senior position in a corporation called TD Bank, maybe you're familiar with it, to going to a studio and basically they said to me, we're gonna pay you the lowest salary possible. Like, what can you live on without starving? And I'm like, I guess like 30 grand a year. And that was like one third of my salary at the bank, okay? They're like, okay, well, that's what you're gonna make here. And if you bring in some projects, then we're gonna give you a cut of each project and we'll see how it goes from there. And I was actually like over the moon, okay? Because I didn't care about the money. The most important thing to me was that I am now on the right path, that I am now in the world where I feel I belong, that now money in a certain amount of time is not gonna be an issue. And why is that? Because you are on a path that is using your unique talent, your unique superpower. What do you think happens when you get to spend most of your days and most of your life doing nothing but using your superpower? The money is gonna come. I wanna share a funny way in which I would actually manage to get my first projects when I've never done projects except for the ugliest car in the world. So what I would do is the studio would actually be working on a bunch of stuff that I wasn't involved in. So there would be like project briefs printed out and laying around the studio. And every project brief would actually have the brand logo of whatever campaign that that brief or that script belonged to. So we would have like briefs for McDonald's, for Nike, but I wasn't working on those, it was other people. But I would take those briefs and I'd put them in my backpack and I would go hang out in bars in where the advertising agencies were and where a lot of creatives would spend their time working. A lot of ad people work at bars, just, just a little tip. And so I would sit in this bar where a lot of people would come through and I started meeting people and the first question, that happens between two people that work in the ad industry is usually, hey, what's up? What are you working on? And the perfect answer to that question that my first mentor in the industry taught me is when somebody asks you, what are you working on? You basically sneer, you go, what am I not working on, right? So the funny thing about the ad industry like if you watch Mad Men, you see that it's a lot of theater. It's a lot of circus. You got to have a lot of confidence and there's actually no room for people who are being totally honest when they first break into the business. And when somebody asks them, hey, what are you working on? They go, well, you know, I'm just polishing my chops. I'm still learning. So if you have a opportunity for me, I would really love to, to learn with your project. That's suicide, folks. Once you are in the business, you're basically ready. You have to be ready. And that's why it's important not to lie to yourself. Like, you could fake it till you make it in our business in a sense that, like me, you might not have any projects, but you feel supremely confident in your skill 
and your ability to execute on a project if it comes to you. And that's the feeling that I had. So when somebody asked me, what are you working on? I would say, what am I not working on? And I would have these scripts laying in front of me right beside my pint of beer. And so they would basically, you know, catch a glimpse of them and be like, holy crap, this guy's working on everything. McDonald's, Nike. Wow. So there was nothing about me to prevent them from giving me a project. I was confident. I was basically seeming like the kind of guy who could do a great job on the music. And that's how I started getting my first projects. I had no idea what I was doing, right? But I would bring the projects back to the studio and my first mentor, who was the owner of the studio at the time, basically showed me everything that I have to do, each step I have to take in order to start creating music for the commercial, start sourcing the right composers to oversee the project, to present the demos to the agency, to revise them, to have the session, to record the voiceover talent, to mix the track, all of that. I learned very quickly. Now, why did the learning and why did my success come quickly? Because again, folks, I was on the right path. Why was my progress so slow in my day job? Because I didn't care for it. My superpowers weren't involved, right? So this is why it's so important at all costs to be able to take two steps back in your career if you have to in order to take a quantum leap forward. Another example of this is two years after I joined the studio at a minimum salary, I was made partner. My first mentor decided to sell the studio. I bought it with another guy and here I was. I was a big chief at the studio I just joined a couple of years ago. This is how fast progress happens when you align yourself on a path that is using your superpowers, okay? Now, here's an interesting twist in the story. A few years after that, I ended up, while vacationing in Europe, meeting a girl and falling in love. And for reasons that would probably justify another video altogether, maybe even an hour long lecture, I decided to again, take a leap of faith, sell my shares in this studio in Toronto and move to Europe to be with this girl and start a relationship. So once I was in Europe to be with my soulmate, uh, who now, by the way, is the mother of my two beautiful children, we're married and this is beautiful, this is 10 years later, I love you, Mwah. Once I was in Europe, I had an offer from one of the finest music production companies in the world called Massive Music, they are in Amsterdam, to join them as a music producer. So I ended up in Amsterdam at Massive Music as a music producer. And again, evolution. Only a few years later, I became a creative director of their sound branding department. And their sound branding department is basically a place that worked directly with brands on very interesting projects like brand sound identities and music driven events, experiential events, sound strategies, and all sorts of things like that. And here is where I really had a chance to work on world-class stuff. In Toronto, I was working mostly on local Canadian campaigns. But when I moved to Amsterdam, I got a chance to work with international brands, with international ad agencies. So I really took a leap forward in my experience. And so, hey, I'm glad that I actually took a leap and it was all because of a girl. After a few years at Massive Music in Amsterdam, I decided that it's time to again take a leap to keep evolving. And I decided to open my own company, my own music production company, because I felt like I have enough contacts in the business now. I have enough experience to be able to do this on my own. And so I did that. That was three years ago and I am still on my own and I'm still making a living, making music for brands. And I get to work with some of my very talented friends who I hire for each campaign that I work on. And so I gotta say, I'm a really fortunate guy. I feel really blessed and I am glad, I am glad that I did not let fear from holding me back and taking that leap over 10 years ago when I was sitting in a safe, cushy corporate job. This is basically my story, but now let's summarize it into some key lessons that I really want you to remember and apply 
in your life and in your work. Lesson number one, understand the business before you try to break in. I was eager as hell. I was desperate, dreaming of making music my full-time career. And in all of my enthusiasm and in all of my excitement, I skipped one very important part, and that is understanding the market that I am trying to break into. I wasted thousands of dollars unnecessarily and spent months confused about why no one is calling me back simply because I did not investigate and research the market with someone from the inside. So this is a mistake you don't wanna make. You don't wanna get your advice based on a friend's opinion or based on academic theory. What you want is you wanna have a coffee with an insider. You wanna be hearing from a guy like me who's already on the inside, who already knows how things work. Not only that, who was once where you are today and is able to see what you need to do to break into the business. Lesson number two, you gotta learn how to present yourself, okay? And there are three things here that I'm gonna talk about. Number one, people in this business are busy. Deadlines are deadly fast, deadly fast. So we are extremely busy people. We got a short attention span. We got to focus on priorities. You can imagine that if you write me a long autobiography that includes details of you being a master of the flute at the age of three, this is not information that is relevant to me. This is not information that I can use in any way to make my work, which is immediately in front of me, any better, right? So basically, what do I do? I have to ignore this email. As much as I respect you as a human being and your musical ability and your flute playing at the age of three, I simply cannot use this information or what you're giving me in order to make my work better. And guess what my priority is? making my work better. The important thing before you contact the business is not only to understand how the business works and who you should be contacting, but know that they're busy. Don't write long emails. Don't have people searching for your links. Make your email as succinct, crisp, compact as possible with like zero difficulty for the recipient to find out immediately what it is that you do and to be able to apply it in whatever it is that they're doing. So knowing how to present yourself doesn't mean just thinking about yourself. It means thinking about your end recipient. And the number one question you should ask yourself is, how is what I do really well going to make their work better? That should be what it is that you're writing about in your email, okay? The second thing in presenting yourself well is to make it absolutely idiot-proof. You have to make it as easy as possible for your recipient to find out very, very, very quickly what it is that you are the best at. So that doesn't mean sending me seven links to different SoundCloud, Spotify's, whatever. Okay, I see seven links, I tune out. It doesn't mean sending me a link to a website where I cannot immediately find what it is that you do, where I have to browse around and search. No, I give up. And it doesn't mean sending me a link to uh, a piece of music that is 30 minutes long and I have to wait for it to build and I have to wait for it to show me the magic. No, folks, give them a link or better yet, attach something to your email that immediately, immediately gives them goosebumps where your superpower intersects with what it is that the industry wants, that sexy, edgy sound, make it immediately accessible to the recipient. And that brings me to point number three. I talked about that intersection of your superpower with what the industry needs. Look, you might be really skilled at certain things. Maybe it's songwriting. Maybe it's sound design. Maybe you compose classical pieces. Maybe you create amazing hybrid pieces of electronica and orchestral instruments. Great. I applaud you. This is wonderful. I'm glad you were born. But you have to meet in the middle with the market you are serving, okay? The difference between being an artist and being a commissioned craftsperson, which is what we are, is that we are getting paid to serve client needs. 
we are getting paid to serve market needs. As an artist, you can do whatever the hell you want, okay? It is your prerogative. If you want to play the flute for three days straight and sell that as a recording, fantastic. I wish you all the best in the world. But if you want to break into this business, you have to be aware of what is going on in the market, what kind of music and songs and scores and sounds you're seeing in famous commercials, and ask yourself, okay, where does that intersect with what I do best? Next up, we got lesson three, which is two steps back, 10 steps forward. Remember what I did? I left a cushy job at the bank with a great salary to take a pay cut to be a sales guy for a studio. That's what I did. Why did I do that? Because I knew if I take two steps back, I'll actually end up where I need to be in the industry where I belong, on the path where I want to be, where my superpower is finally going to be used. I went from being a low salary sales guy to being a partner in a studio, and then the experience that gave me propelled me into one of the best music companies in the world in Amsterdam. And even there, I started as a music producer, but ended as a guy who was running the creative department in dealing with some of the world's biggest brands, okay? Never be afraid to sacrifice where you are in order to evolve, in order to take a leap forward. It might seem uncertain, it might seem like even a crazy thing to do because things are going really well and you're in the groove here. But believe me, folks, life is always about graduating. Don't stay in school forever, folks. You got to keep graduating, elevating, moving up. And sometimes in order to move up, you got to take two steps back temporarily. So now, if my story and these lessons I just shared with you resonated with you at all, and you want to find out more, I invite you to makingmusicforbrands.com where I prepared a PDF that will show you the seven ways you can make money with music in the world of brands. Whether you're a singer, songwriter, composer, mix engineer, you will see all the different roles that are involved in making music for brands and how much you can actually expect to make in each of these roles. And also, if you want to go beyond that, I am currently having a pre-sale at makingmusicforbrands.com where you can reserve a spot for my upcoming class, which is going to launch in late September, which will basically teach you everything I know about how this business works and how you can break into the business of making music for brands. I hope you enjoyed this because I did. I hope this resonated with some of you out there. Keep your hope alive. Don't give up, all right? If you have the musical talent, you truly believe that and you're honest with yourself and you're willing to work hard, there is a pathway for you, believe me, because I took it and many of the musicians that I work with took it and so you got to keep your dream alive and you got to believe that it is possible if you're willing to put in the work and you have somebody on the inside guiding you and holding your hand when it's necessary. It's been fun, folks. Thank you for watching. I'm Tommy Z. Thank you, musician on a mission for having me. It's been a blast and I'll see you around. And by the way, just to be clear, I have nothing against the flute, okay? So... If the flute is your thing, don't give up, keep at it.